And Crenshaw, find a, find a slide for me. When he shall come with trumpet call. Find that slide for me in just a moment. Then we're going to go to John chapter 18 this morning. We've been talking about why did Jesus come. We all know that Jesus came. We celebrate Christmas. We know that in a manger laid a baby Jesus in a stable. And we all know that story. The shepherds come. The wise men come a little bit later. And we, we know that he came. But the real question that I wanted to press home this, this year is why? Why did Jesus come? And I have gone to text where Jesus said, I came, and then he gives an explanation. I came to do the will of the Father. I came so that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I came to save the world. Interestingly enough, we're going to the very end of Jesus' life today, John chapter 18, and we're going to talk about his interaction with, uh, with a guy named Pilate. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. And then that last sentence I want you to hear, faultless stand before the throne. There's a lot of folks that still believe that one day we're all going to stand before God and he's going to bring judgment upon us or that he's going to question us about our lives and how we've lived our lives and all of that. I don't believe that to be true. I believe that the scripture says that when I'm covered by his righteousness, that when I stand before the Father, I stand there faultless. So I'm telling you right now, I, when God looks at me right now, he sees me as faultless. Now, when you look at me, you don't see me as faultless. Amen. There were some loud amens out there. I was hoping none at all, but boy, oh boy. When, you, when, when I look at you, I don't see all of you as faultless. I see all of your faults sometimes, and we see each other's faults all the times. But the idea that there's a possibility that when we stand before the Father, we can stand there faultless. We can stand there with Him looking at us saying, I find no fault in you. Pilate, believe it or not, when he stands before Jesus and Jesus stands before him, he questions him for a few moments and then he goes out to the crowd and he says to the crowd, I find no guilt in this man. I find no fault in him. When I look at him, I find nothing that I can judge. I find nothing that I can condemn. I find nothing that I can penalize him on. Do you remember the, I love, I love old game shows. Do you like old game shows? If I mention the name Monty Hall, what game show do you think of? Let's make a deal. Those people would dress up in those crazy fool costumes. Do you remember that? And Monty Hall would say, uh, you stand up. And then they would give them an option of something. You can have this $100 bill or you can take what's in the box. And, and, and you know, he would always make the box sound real appealing, didn't he? And then he sometimes say, I'll give you $200 to take the, or to take the box. Which one do you like? And he always made the box to feel real appealing. And so you'd give up the $200 and they'd open up the box and it would be clipped toenails or something. It would just be something unreal. You know, years worth of dog food, something I always wanted. At the end of the show, there was always this. You can have what's behind door number one or door number two, or you can go to curtain number three. And everybody would go, oh, I don't know what to do. And they'd look around and everybody would say, take number three. No, take number two. No, no, no. One, one, one. Do you remember how the game was played? And then that came that moment of truth. Which one are you going to pick? I'll take door number one. And then they'd say, well, let's find out what was behind curtain number three. And they'd open up curtain number three. And it would be something like an exotic cruise. And you knew that that person was in trouble when they said, let's see what's behind box number two. And they'd open up door number two, and it would be a more than a year's supply of dog food. It would be, you know, it'd be a whole new kitchen and and a, a car and fire. And you knew good and well that when they opened up door number one, it wasn't going to be good right? And they would open up door number one and it'd be a goat. And you could see that person go, (laughs) that's funny. None of them really laughed genuinely. They all just kind of went, you're kidding me, right? Because they had an expectation of something. 
Many of us today are passing through life and we have expectations of what God owes us and what God should give to us and what God ought to do on our behalf. And really, we're making choices and we have to live out the consequences of those choices. This morning, I'm going to share with you, I shared my, in my melting pot class this morning, I'm going to share what I consider to be three ultimate truths. Three absolute truths that cannot be argued with, at least in my faith and in my, my life. Turn with me to John chapter 18 for a moment. Go down to verse 37. John, Jesus and Pilate have had a conversation. Therefore, Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Now, the problem with that question is, if he says, yes, I am a king, then Pilate says, well, you're now in rebellion against the government. We have no king but Caesar. If he says to him, no, I'm not a king, then he goes against the whole purpose that he came to be what? King of the world. King Almighty. King of kings and Lord of lords. So here Jesus is being confronted with truth and reality of truth. Are you a king? And he says the truth. Jesus answered, you said correct, you say correctly that I am a king. Notice what Jesus didn't say. Jesus didn't say, yep, I am a king. That's what he said. He said, you said correctly that I'm a king. It was indirect, was it not? It would have been so much easier if Jesus would turn around, not only am I king, but I'm going to be king of kings and lord of lords. Not only that, I am the Messiah. Let's take it one step. I am the son of a true and living God. Man, he could have unloaded all kinds of truth on Pilate, couldn't he? But he didn't. He simply said to Pilate, you have said correctly, I am a king. For this I have been born. For this I have come into the world. Whoa. Listen to what Jesus is saying. In these last few hours of his life, he confronts Pilate and says, I am going to tell you why I came. I'm going to tell you the very purpose for which I have born, been born. And for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. I find no untruth in him. I find nothing worthy of declaring him guilty and bringing punishment to his life. He is spoken, or he is truth. I want us to think a moment because we have come to some conclusions in our life what truth is. I want to begin with Pilate. What is truth? Notice he didn't wait for Jesus to give an answer. I kind of get the idea that Jesus and Pilate are confronting each other. They're talking to each other. And Jesus says, I have come to give testimony to the truth. I am here to testify to the truth. And Pilate says, what's truth? And he walks out. Does anybody know what truth is? I have to say today that we have so misconstrued construed the idea of truth that we might want to be asking the questions ourselves, what is truth? We've come to the conclusion that truth is what we choose to believe and not necessarily what is true. That many times what one person speaks the truth, we will say is not a truth, but someone can speak an untruth and we'll call it the truth. And we have come to the place where we no longer want to really know what the truth is. We really have ulterior motives behind truth. We don't want to get down to what the facts are. And in a court of law, when you stand before that, that, that clerk and you put your hand on a Bible sometimes and you raise your right hand and you say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And we used to say, so help me God, but we don't even do that anymore. I'm going to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And then we get on the stand and we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're lying. Or people will say things like this, I didn't say that. But Jan and I, when we first got married, there were a couple of instances that happened early in our marriage that 
that kind of helped me understand this role of truth in my life. We were living in Louisville, Kentucky, and Jan had very long blonde hair all the way down to her rear end. It was just beautiful blonde hair. So one of the things that attracted me to Jan was her long and beautiful blonde hair. And she said to me, I'm going to go and get a haircut. And we went to the mall. Now, I learned don't ever get a haircut at a mall. That's another story. But Jan went over to one of these places, and she got a haircut, and I went to look at something else. And I was walking through the mall, and I walked right past Jan and didn't recognize her. Okay, get the the picture? Okay. Her hair was like right here, and it was shaped differently. and, And I just walked by, and she went, Steve. And I did, the, I did the husband thing. I lied. Oh, I was just playing. <laughs> Reality was, I just walked right past her. And then she would go, and she would come home from getting her hair done, and that was always a moment of truth for me. And the first couple of things, I realized that I wasn't really good at telling the truth. Do you like my hair? And I would say, I love your hair. And she said, I hate it. And the next time she would come home and she would say, do you like my hair? And this time it had been a perm. And she walked in and she had the perm and and she said, do you like my perm? And I said, you smell like a fruit salad. That was the wrong thing to say. It was truthful. I mean, it did. I don't know what it smelled. Whatever they put in her hair made it smell really just, just really awful. But then I learned how to deal with truth. The door would open. What do you think of my hair? I don't know, dear. What do you think of your hair? And whatever she thought of her hair is what I thought about her hair. I really didn't have an opinion. Right? Because speaking the truth sometimes of what your opinion is may not necessarily be the right thing or the good thing to do. Oftentimes, we in our religion will do the same thing. We, we think that we have an absolute truth, and then when we speak that absolute truth, we're doing more damage than good in people's lives. We sometimes think that we have the right to destroy somebody with the almighty truth of God, and we swing our swords as if we're trying to behead somebody for the cause of Christ. That is not how Jesus used truth. Jesus used truth in three ways. He testified to truth in three aspects. I call these the absolute truths of life. You may disagree with these absolute truths, but for me, there is nothing, there is absolutely no mixture of error in these three truths that I believe Jesus came to testify to. Okay? Now, did Jesus come to testify that baptism should be by immersion? Well, if you're a Baptist, you might say, well, yeah, that's theologically correct, and that's the truth. But does it really matter? And you might say, did Jesus come, and when he broke the bread and said, this is my body, did he literally mean that this bread was now turning into his body? And if you happen to be Lutheran, that might be an important thing for you. Or if you happen to be Catholic in the Holy Eucharist, that might be something important to you. But are there some absolute truths that we cannot compromise? Truth number one, God formed us. <clears throat> no matter what we might think about this, and, and, and no matter what you might understand as far as evolution or creationism or all the other things, we have to believe that God is involved in our lives and that God has created us for a purpose. If we do not believe that God created us and that God formed us and that God made us who we are, then everything else that Jesus came to proclaim becomes nonsense. I believe that I was formed by God. I believe that God created the human race. I believe that God intended for that because we were to have fellowship with God. Understand that truth. God desires to have fellowship with humanity. I love the way the Genesis tells that story. Now, whether this happened the way I tell it or whether the purpose behind this is important doesn't really matter. What does matter is that the book of Genesis says to us that God and man walked together. 
that God formed man and that God desired to have fellowship with man, he created us. If I don't believe in a God, and if I don't believe in a God that has formed me, Jesus is, the rest of Jesus' words become nil and void. I come to tell you what the Father is talking about. I come to help you understand the God who created you. And when you see me, you see the Father. Well, if I don't believe the Father created me, why do I want to know what he says? And why would I want to know what he, how he impacts my life or anything like that? If I don't believe in God from the very beginning, then hearing God doesn't mean, it, doesn't mean anything to me. Are you following me here? I believe and I choose to believe that it is an absolute truth that I come from God and so do you. In that early Genesis account, it says that God made a little mud in the ground, and he formed man out of the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became, and the Hebrew says, a living nephesh, a living being, a living spirit. How many have absolutely lost the truth that God is alive? that God created us, that God has a desire to be intimately involved in our lives, that God chooses to be present, that He wants to walk with us and He wants us to walk with Him. How many times have I shared the illustration that God oftentimes is right there in some of the simplest things that we see in life? God reveals Himself constantly to us. I believe He's there. The second absolute truth, I believe, is that sin, if God formed us, sin then deformed us, made us less than what, created, what God created us to be. All right? How are we deformed? We're deformed physically, we're deformed emotionally, we're deformed spiritually. When we disobey God and when we move outside of God's obedience and we move outside of God's fellowship, we are deformed. We're not what God intended for us to be. The whole concept of sin is missing the mark. We often think sin is what we do. How many of you sinned this week? Those of you not raising your hand are lying. So you, 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 you caught up today. Okay, you sinned today. All right. So everybody, everybody's universally a sinful. We all know that. We're, we're aware of that. But what we're thinking of are things that we did. Now let's just assume that everybody here raised their hand and said, yeah, I, I sinned this week. And then I ask everybody to stand up and tell us what you did. We'd get real quiet, wouldn't we? And we would change what we thought about <laughs> to something that might be a little more acceptable to people. And here's the common one. I told a lie. It's the most common when you ask people what they did that was sinful. I told a little white lie. Show me in the Bible where it says anything about little white lies. See, it doesn't. But what we're failing to understand is that that's not sin. That's the symptom of sin. Sin is a germ of how we relate to God. It is the deformed static, the state that we're in because we are separated from God. And we, that affects us physically. That affects us emotionally. It affects us spiritually. In other words, physically we do things that we shouldn't do because we have this germ. We do things emotionally. We get all out of war sort because we have this germ. We get spiritually out of whack because we have this germ. And this germ is constantly wanting us to be deformed. It wants us to be less than what God created us to be. If you were to take the word for sin in the Old Testament, it means taking a bow and arrow and pointing it at a target and missing the bullseye. You miss the mark. Sin for me is that I miss the mark. I'm not what God formed me to be. I am less than what God formed me to be. And sin has caused me to be less than that. The third absolute truth, according to what Jesus was saying to, to Pilate here, is that only I can transform you from deformed back to what God formed you to be. Put up that slide. Crenshaw, you still got it? When, Trump, when, when Christ shall come and trumpet sound. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless. Did you hear the word? Faultless. 
sinless, holy, perfect. But man, that's not what my life's been. My life's not been faultless. It's not been perfect. It's not been everything that it should be. I picked the wrong door. I went through the wrong door, and I have suffered the consequences of going through the wrong door. But the Scripture says that it is a truth that Jesus came to take those of us who have made wrong decisions, picked the wrong door, if I might say it, have become deformed because of sin, can one day stand faultless before God. Wow. How's that happen? You know, there's a few things that I can change about myself. I can change my education. Do you know that? I've been to school. I learned some things. I can change because I'm constantly learning. I can change my appearance. How many of you noticed today I've lost 32 pounds? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see that hand. I see that hand. Yeah. I'm proud of myself. Yesterday we were in a shopping mall and I snuck through a little itty bitty space because it was so crowded and Jan said, look at your skinny self and I just grinned. (laughs) I can change my appearance. I can put on a wig if I want to. A full wig. I can shave my mustache. I can't get taller. I've tried that. Uh, you know, I just tried to be, I can't do, there's some, but I can change my appearance. I can change how you see me on the outside. We often think about the clothes that we wear and how people see us. I can even change my actions if I want to. I can be more kind. I can be more forgiving. I can do nice things for people. I can change my actions. But you know, there's some things I cannot change. I cannot change my past. And I really can't change my present. And here's something I want you to hear very clearly I cannot change my future. Well, preacher, what about that standing faultless before the throne? You didn't hear it, did you? Dressed in His righteousness alone. I can't change. I can't change my future because I have been deformed by sin. But what's the truth that Jesus spoke about? I have come to do the will of the Father. To bring man back into the fellowship. I've come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. I've come so that you can enjoy this life and have it eternally. I have come to save you from that which you cannot save yourself from. The truth is I can change your future when you can't. And I can change your past and make it as if it never has happened in the eyes of God. And I can help change who you are today if you're willing to let that change be made in your life. So here you are, folks. You can choose door number one and live in your past all you want to. I don't know how many times I hear people say things like, I wish we could go back to the 1950s. I wish we could go back to the good old days. Now, how many of you honestly really want to go back to the good old days? Now, let's qualify good old days, pre-air conditioning. Everybody's hand, pre-automatic washing machines, pre-dishwashers. Now, we like kind of the feel that we had back in those days, but we don't want the inconveniences of our past. 
And many times we want to go back into our lives and think that if we could go back there, we could change what we do. We could change who we are. You can't. So you can't pick number one and say to God one day, look at all the good things I did in my past. You really honestly can't change who you are today because right now you are a sinner. You have been deformed by sin. And because of that, you cannot change your future. Those are truths, absolute truths. But Jesus said, I can change who you are right now. I can make you what? A new creature. I can make the past go away. So when the God the Father looks at your past, he sees absolutely nothing. I like Tori, Corey Tim Boom. I love her analogy of grace. Jesus came and he took all my sins, every one of them, and he put them in a big old treasure chest. And he wrapped that treasure chest all up with chains and threw it into the depths of the ocean and then put up a sign that said, no fishing here. I love that. What did God say? I will separate my sin from my, your sin from me as far as the east is from the west. Do you understand what that means? Do you know if I start traveling north that eventually I'll get to the North Pole? And if I cross the North Pole, I'm traveling what? South. But did you know if you started traveling west from here? And I don't know why anybody would want to go west from here. But if you went west from here, you'd go to Wyoming and you'd go to oh, Kansas and you'd go to all these states that are out there in the west and you'd get to California and you'd think you'd come to the end of the west, but you can just keep on going. And you know, eventually you'll, you'll get to Hawaii and then you'll get to Asia and then you'll start all the way back and you'll come back to the exact point that you started and you never changed directions. You went west. What did God say? I'll take your sins and it'll go away and never, ever, ever change directions. It will never come back. Folks, I don't live in fear today of going into eternity and meeting my Savior and meeting my God and realizing that I'm carrying a lot of baggage because my past has been forgiven. So in the present, I enjoy that. I live that. And I know that although I could not change my future, God in Christ did. Jesus said, I came, and it's a truth. I can change your destination. I can change the direction you're going. Yesterday in a crowded parking lot, I saw a man with a cart full of stuff, and he was looking for his car. And it was kind of funny because he was weaving his way, and he'd stop every now and then he'd go, and then he turned around and went back the same way that he came. And he'd go a few rows over and he'd stop and he'd look around. And then he'd come back the same direction that he just came and he just, he could not find his car. He was lost. We saw two ladies come up and they had lost their car. And she pushed a little button and her car went beep, beep. She said, I am so glad because I never can find my car. I was lost, but now I'm found. Jan and I always park on the same row. When we come out of Walmart, we go straight. <laughs> And we will drive around and around and around and around until we can park on that row because neither one of us can remember where we parked the car. So we always know if we go out the door that we came in, you just keep going straight and eventually we'll find our car. It's, it's down there somewhere because we parked in that place. Understand what I just said. Some folks are looking and searching, but they're lost. Some people have found an answer. They, have, they, they found a way. They're, they know that they can find their direction. And some people park there. 
Some people live there. Some people stay there. And it becomes the absolute truth for their life. The absolute truth of my life is God formed me, sin deformed me, and Jesus transformed me. And beyond that, it doesn't really matter much. Let's pray. Dear Father, we sometimes argue until we're blue in the face about what absolute truth is. And maybe Jesus said it to Pilate clearly. I've come to bear witness to the truth. If I be lifted up, I'll draw them in unto me. My kingdom is not of this world. I sometimes think, God, it would have been so much easier if Jesus would have just looked at Pilate and said, you're doing it all wrong, and I'm going to change it right here, right now. But that's not the kind of change that Jesus came to make. He didn't care about the politics. He didn't care about <clears throat> what was right and what was wrong as people looked at it. He didn't care about the falseness of truths. He simply came to remind us of an ultimate truth that our lives were formed by God. We're His. We've been bought with a price. Sin has deformed our lives, has made us what we're not supposed to be. We're falling short of what created us for. But that He came to transform us and put us back so that we can stand before the throne faultless, perfect, redeemed, not worrying about giving an account for our lives because that has already been resolved by the blood of Christ. We pray, Father, that next week in our morning service when we talk about the invitation that you give to us, that when you say, this is why I came, but will you accept it? That we might find a place in our hearts to say we want that truth. We know that we have been formed by God. We know that we're deformed. We're not what we need to be. And may we resolve the issue of what it means to be transformed in Him so that our futures will be faultless before the throne. 